and we're going to discuss today how to be your own lawyer. How to go to court, how to write paperwork that you can go into court and prosecute your case with. So I'm going to show how to create court documents and the procedures to follow in preparing for court. I mean, I'm extremely amateur at this, but you know, I've got some experience. And so what I'm going to tell you is that it doesn't take a whole lot of studying and learning to be able to do this. It's not impossible. And if we're going to hold anybody accountable for their actions, my feeling is, is unless they, you can take them to court and make them defend themselves, they don't care if you complain about things. Most of us never go to court and would consider it somewhat more dreaded than going to the dentist. It is true that an element of satanic worship is present in the court system today as they are taken over by greedy people bent on lining their pockets with the fruit of our labor. But because of necessity, I feel the need to venture forth in this arena. The beginning of the process starts with a controversy. I mean, if you're not having an argument with somebody, there's no reason going. Two people have, a, have to disagree about something, and the administrative process will begin. In the administrative phase, one party sends another party a demand for payment of some sort of property that they believe they have a right to. And that could be, you know, getting prosecuted for a crime, violating a public policy today. I have never seen government agents or banking-related institutions ever send factual, verified proof of the alleged debt. They just make the demand. I have a whole show on administrative remedy, and if you have not watched it, now is the time to do so, as it is a very important part of the battle, in that it sets the foundation for later. Every action you take will have the purpose of gaining court-admissible evidence. All courts recognize the importance of administrative procedure in that it helps remove controversies that need to be adjudicated from being presented and wasting the court's precious time. If one party is in dishonor and, ref and refuse to participate in the administrative process, they are denied the right to cry about it later and are looked down upon by the court for acting in dishonor. This is noted in the maxim of law that states, quote, he who slumbers on his rights loses them. And, quote, failure to deny is to admit. And the concept of acquiescence and latches. And here's from Black's Law the definition of acquiescence. Acquiescence and latches are cognate but not equivalent terms. The former is a submission to or resting satisfied with an existing state of things. In other words, if you don't complain about it, you have acquiesced to it. While latches implies a neglect to do that which the party ought to do for his own benefit or protection. In other words, latches uh, gets counted when you fail to respond or a, a period of time has gone by and you haven't done anything to protect your rights. Hence, latches may be evidence of acquiescence. Latches imparts, imports a merely passive assent, while acquiescence implies active assent. In re Wilbur's Estate 334, PA 45, 5, comma 5, A 2nd, 325, 331. Quote, acquiescence relates to an inaction during performance of an act, while latches relates to delay after the act is done. Bay, Newfoundland Company versus Wilson and Company, 24, DEL, period, chapter 34, A 2nd, 66. 668, 671, 673. Quote, acquiescence is a species of estoppel. Quote, Bankers Trust Company versus Rude, 211, Iowa, 289, 233, Northwest, 794, 802, 73, A period, L period, R period. And this is from Black's Law, 4th edition, printed in 1968, page 40. Let's move on to the court procedure. If you are being sued and have gotten a notice or summons to appear, the clock is ticking and your time will run out on your opportunity to defend your rights and you will lose by default if you, quote, failure to deny. 
fail to deny and slumber on your rights by not putting a response into the court record in writing. First thing to do is to go down to the clerk of the court, whether it be criminal, the criminal side or civil side, depending on the suit against you, and ask for a true copy of the complaint if it's civil. If, if it's criminal, then the traffic ticket or a warrant for your arrest although they may have not arrested you yet and just had you sign a promise to appear. Once you have received the complaint, you must file an answer or you will have lost your right to challenge it and receive a default judgment. So let's go into the timeline of what's going on to unfold in a court battle and try to acquire a simple understanding of what's going on. The beginning of all lawsuits starts with a complaint. So what is a complaint? The complaint is a signed declaration by the plaintiff. The plaintiff is the one that's prosecuting or suing, who is the one making the claim that an injury or loss has occurred. Describes the injury or loss, and it has to be personal, it has to be, it, they have to have suffered the loss, presents facts that support the claim, and presents law, case law and codes, statutes, or some other form of regulation that shows when the facts presented are proven to be true, damages are due to the plaintiff for being injured either physically or through a loss by a breach of contract. Unless you are fairly wealthy and lazy, you will not be well represented by an attorney in the doc in the document writing stage of the lawsuit as no attorney will be able to properly prepare a case against their own masters. Because, let's face it, who sues you? You know, how many suits in court today are, you know, your, your gardeners taking you to court because you didn't honor the contract? 99% of the suits are either the government is uh, assessing a damage, a charge against you for violating public policy, another word for crime, right? You violated the penal code or the civil code or whatever. Or it's the bankers who, through credit card or mortgage or some kind of debt, are taking you to court. Your neighbor's hardly ever taking you to court. Which are, if you are defending against the government, would be the ones who granted the attorney his privilege of making a living through the license to practice law. And if it's the bankers, then he will know that they are the true self-appointed owners of the courts. If you go to trial, then an attorney may be able to do much better, a better job of examining and cross-examining witnesses as the, the judge and opposing counsel will be merciless with their objections to deny you getting evidence to the jury through testimony. You can hire an attorney if you can find one willing to help you, but only if you hire one, only on the condition that they are co-counsel, which is like having a joint bank account where both signatures are required. If they contact to, contract to help you as co-counsel, then you have the right to deny their actions in court. Without the co-counsel status, they have the right to speak against your wishes. I mean, if you sign an agreement to represent you, then even if you don't want them to do something, they have, the, they have the legal right to do it because of that contract. You are considered incapable of speaking in court and a ward of the court once you get an attorney. You can, no one can know your case better than you. Some can present your case better than you, but most likely the court will not allow them to be your constitutionally allowed counsel. I mean, if you've got somebody like me who's a legal scholar to speak on your behalf, the court will immediately challenge you as not being a licensed attorney, and therefore you cannot represent, represent someone else. Because the courts are private, for-profit business, for businesses that only give token lip service to be in public places. Can a policeman tell you to put away your cell phone if you're on the street or tell you you can't nap on the park bench? To get into a position to enforce your rights, you will need to first answer their suit and then file a counterclaim to become the plaintiff in your own complaint against them because at this point they will be trespassing on your rights unless they have a lawful claim. The plaintiff always wins, the defendant always loses. I always write up a common law court of record counterclaim 
and note all the defects in their suit against me and claim they are committing fraud and have no jurisdiction. That's the big one right there. And as many other things as I can find as possible. As I indicated previously, the first thing to do is to send in a conditional acceptance and make your claims, noting no jurisdiction, no corpus delecti, or, and, and or no standing, no factual evidence supporting a claim upon which relief can be granted, because if they don't have any evidence, factual evidence in their claim, then they haven't produced anything. No license to practice law in evidence. No power of attorney to represent the plaintiff, because they never show you the contract they have with the, uh, with the plaintiff, do they? So how, how do they have a right to represent them? No evidence of a, quote, real party of interest under Federal Rules of Civil Procedure 17A, etc. Have this sent by a notary, proof of service. In other words, you get the notary to sign a proof of service and send it on your behalf and get an affidavit of non-response and send them a notice of default if they do not respond to this administrative procedure. So let's look at an actual counterclaim. Okay, here's an actual counterclaim example. In the upper left corner is the name of the presenter of the document. So up here it would be the attorney's name or if you're presenting this document for your case, it'd be your name your address, and your address is going to be, if you want to be on the private side, you're going to be non-commercial. So no, ND is non-domestic, and you can put your zip in there, but your zip is going to have to be in a box, because anything in a box is not uh, visible to the court. So the attorney will show their name, their bar card number, address, because you have the right to, and requirement to send them your documents, right? If you're going to do an opposition or an answer or anything else that you're going to present into court, it's going to be, have to be sent to the other party. So the other party is required to put their name in. Usually a telephone number, but it's not a requirement, so I don't put mine. And the title and the status of the presenter. So in this case, this person would be presenting it, if it's you, as pro per or in your proper persona. And then let me read in proper persona here. And that's straight out of Black's Law. In proper persona is, one of, is one's own proper person. It is a rule in pleading that pleas to the jurisdiction of the court must be pled in propria persona. Because if pleaded by an attorney, they admit the jurisdiction. As an attorney is an officer of the court, and he is presumed to plead after having obtained leave, which admits the jurisdiction. Laws P191. Black's Law, 4th, page, 1968, page 900, is the caption wherein the name of the court is, lo is noted and the plaintiff is noted. So we're going to look at this. Here's the caption at the top where it says the Superior Court, State of California, County of Alameda. That's, and this whole area is the caption, right? Everything above this line. So this is the original, uh, this would be, if you were just plaintiff versus defendant, this box up here would be there. And it, and it identifies the plaintiff and it identifies the defendant and over here it has the case number and if the if you were making a pleading, the pleading would be over here. So it'd be like a complaint or an opposition to a motion or a motion or whatever. <clears throat> then you start in with the body of the writing. Anything below this line would be the body of the writing. So in this case, it would be contempt of court bench warrant. And then you would go on to start making your, uh, making your summary, basically, is what's going on here. And uh, the case number is noted. The title of the document is noted, like motion to dismiss. That would be the title of the document, along with any exhibits or attachments. So you would put exhibits 1 dash through 10, or however, what, however you want to name them. The, the next, then you start in with the body of the writing. Whatever is said in the body of the writing is what controls the paper if there is a conflict between the caption and the body. So it's kind of like when you write on your check and you spell out $1,100. When you spell out $1,100, that's what rules as opposed to writing in 
the dollar sign with a 1100.00, which is $1,100, right?